Hello and welcome back to Chronicle, the history of Newcastle United. I'm Matt Ketchell, football fan, engagement editor at Chronicle Live, and welcome to 1951-52, the season where Newcastle are about to win the fifth FA Cup out of sixth they've lifted in their history. Joining me to describe the run to Wembley and some of the players who made it happen is the club's official historian, Paul Joanne Paul, the good times are back at St James's Park. How was this 1950s Newcastle side regarded among football circles at the time? Well, Newcastle were now uh, FA Cup holders, of course, and, and they were recognised as one of the glamour sides in the country, uh, without any doubt. Um, you know, the players were well known, the likes of Melbourne and Rob Lido and Mitchell and uh, Joe Harvey, Frank Brennan. Uh, they were all, all household names and uh, the club enjoyed a period of high status for, for you know, during the, the 1950s. Um, they continually bought... Uh, brought in new blood, of course, each season. And uh, for this new season of 51-52, uh, they had a couple of new faces. Uh, both came from the lower divisions in Billy Fuchs uh, for £11,500 and Vic Keeble for £15,000. Uh, Welshman Fuchs, an inside forward, was an instant hit. He was capped by his country and to play in the FA Cup final with United uh, that season. Vic Keeble, who... Uh, would eventually take over the number nine shirt. Um, uh, didn't get into the side straight away. He was on national service, um, and uh, but he was also the star at Wembley in the coming years in 1955. Mm. And this was a side that was packed with goal scorers, really, wasn't it? It was indeed. 51-52 uh, uh, was a season that saw the Magpies glow with confidence in, in virtually every game. They scored over 100 goals for the season, 114 in, in total. Um, Melbourne, um, uh, Robledo and Mitchell uh, were full of goals. Um, uh, Robledo got 39, Jackie got 29 and Bobby Mitchell got 14. So, you know, those three alone up front uh, were, were dynamite. Uh, and Robledo equaled Huey Gallagher's long-standing goal-scoring record for a season. Um, and that wasn't to be matched and eventually beaten by Andy Cole when he hit the scene in 1993-94. Yes, it must have been fantastic to watch this side. George Robledo is a cornerstone player when it comes to Newcastle United history. Very talented player, very interesting background. We have to do a little bit of a focus on George. Yeah, well, he was, of course, born in Chile, as probably everybody knows. Um, uh, he had a Yorkshire mother, so he was... You had had English blood in him, uh, but at that time the game only had a handful of overseas players, unlike now. Uh, and Robledo became a very big star. Uh, he had film star looks. Uh, he made his name as a footballer with Barnsley in wartime football, and Newcastle took a, a very strong liking to him uh, and, and brought him to Tyneside. He was he was a stocky forward, uh, always scoring plenty of goals. Uh, moved to Newcastle in January 1949 in a big deal worth £23,000. Now, that was a package with his younger brother, Ted, who was also a player, never as good as George, but he was a decent uh, footballer and indeed played in the cup final for Newcastle. Uh, so George teamed up with Milburn straight away. Uh, he was a perfect foil to, to war Jackie. Um, Robledo did all the hard work. He was a grafter. Uh, but he was also very lethal when the when the opportunity arrived in the box. Uh, he hit the ball true and he hit it hard. Um, and uh, you know, all told, he, he has an excellent record for the club: 91 goals in 166 appearances, and not many players have got a goal ratio uh, that good. Um, he was always favoured uh, back in his back in South America. He, he played for Chile. Um, in the 1950 World Cup and, and uh, was also all, always tempted to go back there. Uh, and, of course, British football had a maximum wage, um, but South America didn't, and he was tempted to go back for a very big financial package. Uh, and he left Newcastle in May 1953. Uh, uh, but certainly for his period at the club, he was a hugely popular player and um, you know, stood alongside the likes of Mitchell and... Mil uh, Melbourne and Brennan as, as the favourites of the side. Yes, and we know things go well in the FA Cup during this season, but what about the league campaign first? 
Well, uh, Newcastle started uh, you know, wonderfully well. They, they just couldn't stop scoring. On the opening day, they, they hit six against Stoke City. Then they quickly gave league champions Tottenham a hiding. Now, Tottenham were an absolutely special side, um, and they the did um, hit Newcastle for seven the previous season. But Newcastle got revenge at St James's Park. They scored seven against Tottenham, um, and they were to record an even more headline win later in the season in London um, against Spurs. Now, Burnley also suffered a seven-goal defeat two weeks later, um, and Newcastle were in fourth spot by Christmas. So they were going very well and challenging at the at the top of the league and and a lot of people's favourites for the title. Mm, and then January arrived, the FA Cup kicks in. Did that affect league performance? It did again. Again, uh, not for the first time. Uh, it seemed to happen over and over again. Uh, the FA Cup interrupted that, that excellent league form. From January onwards, uh, the of course, defended the trophy and it and, and became the first side to successfully secure the cup in successive seasons. You know, not since 1891 had that happened, and that was a monumental feat. You know, back then it just didn't happen. Uh, unlike now, it, it, it's fairly uh, common practice for clubs to get the Wembley, um, and, and one of the big six or seven clubs seem to win it every year. Um, so the FA Cup run that season was hugely demanding, and it, and it you know, took over from league action. Um, Newcastle focused on the on the FA Cup, um, and it was a difficult run, as I say, uh, the most difficult in United's history. Really, um, they faced high-ranking sides from the top division on five occasions uh, uh, to securing the trophy. Interesting. Can you talk us through that a bit then? If the, such a difficult run, it it must have been worth it at the end. But let's hear in a bit of detail who they faced and how they got on. Well, every every game was watched by huge crowds, uh, more or less capacity attendances, home and away. Uh, they opened with a, 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 a glamour tie with Aston Villa, who were you know up at the top of the table as well. Uh, Newcastle won four two at St James's Park. It was an epic tie. Uh, Newcastle were. 2-1 behind at half time so things didn't start well um and you know time was running out then you know the magic of bobby mitchell took over and and he turned it on and newcastle won 4-2 in the end it was a, a wonderful tie um but that was really surpassed um with a game against the league champions tottenham at white hart lane now newcastle you know went there it was a it was a um a mud heap of a pitch uh, with not very much grass on it at all. And against the reigning champions, uh, Newcastle put on a quite brilliant performance. Again, Mitchell was outstanding in the 1 3 0. And that made everybody take notice that, that Newcastle were really at the top of the game. Um, in the uh, fifth round, uh, they, they had a, a bit of a giant killing um, uh, tie to face uh, Swansea Town um, away in Wales. It was a tricky test uh, against lower opposition, but Newcastle won one nil. Um, but again, it was uh, um, you know a packed crowd in at Swansea, and they all wanted to see the the glamour side Newcastle United. Um, and that game took us probably to the the pick of the the uh, the run to Wembley, which was an away game at Portsmouth at Fratton Park. Uh, now, Portsmouth, if we remember, in the late 40s, early 50s, when Newcastle's bogey side, they faced them on several occasions, a couple of years when they were challenging for the title and they were, uh, Newcastle were demolished by Portsmouth. Um, but on this occasion, it was uh, Jackie Milburn who perhaps had his you know, best game ever if we take away you know, their Wembley Cup finals, especially the 1951 uh, uh, final. He scored a brilliant hat-trick as Newcastle won 4-2, and it was uh, another scintillating performance by uh, the Magpies. Now, I'm pretty certain there's clips of that game on YouTube or certainly on Pathé News, uh, and it's certainly worth watching, uh, finding it on, on the web and, and watching it because it's uh, it, it was a terrific game of football. Mm. And... Uh, you know, after Portsmouth, they faced Blackburn in the semi-final. Um, another uh, tough side to, to overcome. Um, and that took two games, two gruelling games. Uh, 
uh, and eventually Newcastle won through a very late penalty kick um, that really no one in the United side appeared to want to take. Um, it was a, a, in the dying five minutes of the game. Um, it must have been nerve-wracking. Uh, you know, everything was level um, and one kick and it was at Wembley. But uh, everybody was looking for someone to take the kick and upstep Bobby Mitchell. He'd never taken a first-class penalty before. Um, he stepped up and walloped the ball and it was in the net and Newcastle were in the cup final again uh, by two goals to one. Amazing. I mean, I'm exhausted just listening to you describe that run to, to the final. So much travelling, Tottenham away, Swansea Town away, Portsmouth away, and then a last gas penalty to make it to the final. We'll talk about that next then. Uh, Saturday the 3rd of May, 1952, Wembley Stadium. Winston Churchill met the players before the game and presented the trophy afterwards. <coughs> what sort of a game did he see? Well, it wasn't an epic. Um, Arsenal, the... the... The, the opponents were, again, one of the top sides in the division and uh, old foes uh, in the cup final uh, for Newcastle back in 1932, of course. Um, they were third in the table, um, so there were no pushovers. It wasn't a brilliant game. Uh, Arsenal, unfortunately, were down to 10 men for a long period. There was no substitutes, of course, back then. That was, uh, what, about 20 years away before substitutes arrived. arrived. Um, there was another late winner, this time by George Robledo. It was his day at Wembley. Uh, it was a lovely uh, Bobby Mitchell run uh, in typical style. He just did that time and time again that season. Uh, went past players and, and a lovely cross to the far po post. Robledo headed up, uh, jumped and headed the ball into the net. Um, and that actual moment uh, was captured by a young, a young supporter. Uh, he was uh, a chap called John Lennon, who later sketched and painted that goal um, and, and reproduced it on one of his album covers. So um, that, that's another link to uh, the famous Beatles after Albert Stubbins in the wartime years. Yes, we'll talk a bit about that at the end of the episode. Uh, great to hear that, though. Bobby Mitchell, the, the unsung hero, it sounds like. Great to hear about his penalty and, and uh, helping set up the goal. Um, but at this stage, I think we should talk about one of the greats, perhaps the greatest ever to wear the black and white, Jackie Milburn. It's a great debate. We might have it at the end of the series. Was he the best ever to play for Newcastle? But this is War Jackie's episode. Please, Paul, can you tell us about John Edward Thompson Milburn? Yeah, well, what, what can I say? Um, you know, he's certainly, as probably everybody knows, from a well-known footballing family, uh, of course. Um, the Milburns and Charltons of uh, Ashington, you know, several... Uh, uh, of that family played first-class football before the war and after the war. Um, uh, nicknamed War Jackie or the Ashington Flyer in his early days um, with those initials of uh, J-E-T, Jet, uh, which was very appropriate. Um, he started on the wing in wartime football, um, uh, switched to the centre-forward role uh, once Albert Stubbins and Charlie Wayman had departed. Um, but he could always revert back to the wing, so he was a fairly um, versatile forward um, over the years. Um, very fast, um, and he hit the ball true uh, and could hit it with uh, either left foot or right foot. Um, England sent the forward for a period, and, and there was a lot of very, very good centre forwards at that time during the 50s. Um, he won 13 caps. Uh, with United from 1943 to 1957. Uh, and he stayed there in more or less all of his career, although he had a short spell with Linfield right at the end of that uh, period. Uh, and he became a, a manager for a, for a short period uh, with Ipswich before returning to the Northeast, where he was a journalist for many a year. Um, he was modest, likeable, a lovely man, uh, and, and still to this day, a legend in the Northeast, uh, Tyneside's favourite son, maybe. Um, the 1951 final was his greatest moment, without doubt. Um, he was there in 1952, and he had another um, uh, great moment in 1955. So three FA Cup winners' medals. Um, and his overall record is just phenomenal. Uh, 494 appearances in all senior football, including wartime. 
238 goals, the very best, uh, although Alan Shearer just topped that in league and cup football. Um, so, you know, was he the best? Um, maybe. He's certainly up there in, in the ranking. And as you see, we might talk about that uh, another time. Yeah. Amazing. And you were lucky enough to meet the man himself, weren't you, Paul? A few times. We'd love to hear about the occasions that this happened. Yeah, I was lucky uh, to see him several times. Uh, and, and once, you know, the first time was as a very young lad, aged about 12. Um, my father knew all the players and directors back then, and uh, he looked after uh, Jackie's testimonial pre-gathering at the County Hotel. Uh, which was a sort of unofficial headquarters for the club during the 50s, 60s and 70s. So I was there with my dad and uh, I was lucky enough to be invited onto the bus with all the players going up to St James's Park for his testimonial in 67. Um, and uh, you know, apart from meeting Jackie and all his uh, colleagues, Frank Brennan and uh, everybody like that, uh, Bobby Mitchell, uh, I got to sit next to the great Puskas, who was the famous <laughs> Hungarian uh, forward who was the guest player uh, at the testimonial and uh, you know I was in awe I was only 12 um, yeah. sitting at the front of the bus with Puskas next to me he couldn't speak a word of English so I just sat there <laughs> and I just sat there you know pretty frightened at the whole occasion um, but he smiled and uh, was a was a nice lad uh, and a, well a nice man at that time and uh, uh, and I vivid, vividly recall uh, the great Puskas of course um, so after that, much later, as the club's historian, I, I, I interviewed him and, and he wrote a, a forward for me as well uh, and saw him at St James's Park quite a few times. And as I said, lovely man, genuine and, and ever helpful. He was always willing to have a chat and, and uh, give advice and talk about his playing career. You know, one of the one of the true greats and a down-to-earth, you know, Washington Geordie lad. Amazing, amazing. Puskas and, Puskas and Jackie Milburn on the same day. Not many people can can have that one in the locker. So um, brilliant to hear that. So yeah, 51-52, amazing season. Um, remarkably, it didn't finish at Wembley for Newcastle, did it? No, the, they collected the trophy, uh, had the usual homecoming, and then um, we're, we're away on another uh, landmark overseas tour. Um, following on from their late 40s trip to North America. This time it was to South Africa, uh, and not many clubs had gone to South Africa at that time. And indeed, they took the FA Cup with them uh, uh, the very first time the, the famous trophy had uh, left uh, the shores of the UK. And it was a lengthy exhibition trek uh, from the 17th of May to the 18th of July. So that was a long, long time traveling all over uh, South Africa. Uh, they played 16 matches and were heroes wherever they went, of course. Um, and uh, I do re recall reading that one of the, the, the fans that watched Newcastle uh, on that tour was the, the great Eusebio. He was mm -hmm. uh, in one of the crowds and uh, um, always uh, remembered watching the black and whites. Um, but in the end, it was a very weary tour um the the traveling um and, and flying they flew back then on on uh one of the first comet flights uh, i seem to remember um and the the magpies paid for it uh, during the following season uh, because mm -hmm. it, it certainly took their to took the tool out of the players yeah um, i can imagine let well i'm sure we'll talk about that in the in the next episode 16 postseason games is, is going to take a, a, a toll so yeah we'll we'll discuss that next wednesday i'm sure um let's end sometimes let's end, let's end as we do sometimes with an image um we discussed albert stubbins on the cover of sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club band album by the beatles in episode 12 that was the choice of paul mccartney um and now john john lennon as you met as you mentioned paul sketched george robledo aged 11 and uh, we've got the picture here that he sketched so I'm going to flash up on the screen uh, for people watching on our YouTube channel or on the video that I upload to Chronicle Live's website. So he used this image on the right uh, for his 1974 solo album, Walls and Bridges. I'll post the image in a story on the website too, so, so you can have a look, listeners, if you want. It's a, a drawing on the right by an 11-year-old John Lennon. And on the left, 
is a still image that I assume he based it on, which is George Obledo scoring the winner for Newcastle in the 1952 FA Cup final at Wembley, as we've discussed. It's a painting by 11-year-old John. It says football at the bottom, and at the top he's written John Lennon, June 1952, aged 11. Um, it's a smashing little painting, actually. I assume he's uh, found that image, Paul, in, in newspapers and, and had a go at drawing it. Yeah, pro- I, I'm sure that's the case. He, he shows Milburn with a number nine on his back, and uh, he's got it pretty well uh, uh, accurate, apart from maybe the goalkeeper didn't dive to his right, he dived to his left, uh, and the ball hit more or less hit the post and went in. But uh, it is a pretty uh, good um, reproduction of the of Robledo's goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Crit- criticising the young John Lennon there. I think he's added a bit of artistic licence to the goalkeeper's dive. It's, it's it's a great shot. I'm a big Beatles fan and a John Lennon fan, so this is this is great for me. The album that he, uh, that he used this for, Walls and Bridges, has some great tracks, including one called Number Nine Dream. The Beatles also famously recorded Revolution Number Nine. Now, obviously, we can see the drawing it also features Jackie Milburn, who has his back to us in the drawing, but Lennon's drawn his big red number nine on the back of his shirt, and apparently Lennon lived as a child at number nine, Newcastle Road. He was born on the 9th of October and had a lifelong obsession with the number. Uh, he was being he was quoted as saying, it's a number that, that has followed him around. And uh, did a bit of research, the house, nine Newcastle Road in Wavertree, Liverpool, sold for four hundred. Eighty thousand pounds in 2013, despite having a guide price of 150 thousand pounds, <laughs> and uh, it's great. The Beatles were famously indifferent towards football, but we've now talked about both Lennon and McCartney paying tribute to two Newcastle legends, Albert Stubbins and George Robledo. Yeah, well, that that that's that's great. I, I didn't actually realise or, or never knew that uh, John Lennon had a thing about the number nine, and he lived in Newcastle. Uh, uh, road, which is uh, amazing. I'll have to go away and uh, have a look at that myself. That's. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if the number nine came from, you know, Jackie Milburn and the number nine shirt after the fifty-one final in the fifty-two final. You know, that that shows how big Newcastle United were. That every young lad in the country, um, you know, could uh, uh, associate themselves with the club, uh, which is uh, you know virtually the way it was back then. Absolutely, yes. And that's what this podcast is all about. Newcastle United are a massive club and we're reminding everyone about it by recording these episodes. Another great one, Paul. Loved hearing about this team, this era in particular. Um, And the best thing is they're not done. They win another FA Cup in the next episode, which we'll talk about next Wednesday. That is the last domestic trophy. We will discuss Newcastle winning Um, and it'll be a bumper episode. Lots to get through and there'll be another relegation in there and possibly the arrival of floodlights at St James's Park as well. So, Look forward to that one, listener. Thanks for tuning in. In the meantime, any Newcastle United history stories, observations, facts or stats, memorabilia, anything, you know where we are, the EIBW podcast at reachplc.com or you can tweet me at Ketchell on Twitter. Uh, Please subscribe to the Everything is Black and White podcast via whichever podcast platform you use. Follow Chronicle Live's Newcastle United channels on social media. We're at Chronicle NUFC on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Are you enjoying Chronicle? I hope you are. This is the halfway point pretty much of the series and a nice five-star review on iTunes would be fantastic if you have time for that. And lastly, just to say, stay up to date with everything black and white by subscribing to our daily Newcastle United newsletters curated by me. That's what I do uh, during the day here at Chronicle Live. They're free. Uh, I send a morning news roundup, an evening news roundup and breaking news as and when it happens. That goes directly to your email inbox. The link, I'll put that in our show notes to, to sign up for the newsletter. You hit that, scroll down to Sport Newcastle United Updates, tick the box, and you'll be signed up for free. Thanks so much for listening to Chronicle, the history of Newcastle United, with me, Matt Ketchell, and Paul Joannou. <laughs>